Hello everyone and welcome back to week two of the free course Introduction to Islamic Art at Safe Cultural Heritage Group. Today we will be talking about mosques, their ornament and clothes with a brief discussion of Islamic ornament. Starting with mosques also referred to as masjid, the so-called place of prostration to God. A mosque is the house of prayer in Islam, and it is said to be modeled after the courtyard of the Prophet's house in Medina. Essential elements that are included in a mosque are a mihrab, a minbar, and a minaret. Usually the space is roofed over and carpets cover the floor so that the ritual prayer can be performed. And usually a place for ablution is in the near vicinity. One could say that the first mosque combines several functions. During the lifetime of the Prophet, it was the seat of government and a civic center where meetings were held, the poor were nourished, and prayers were performed. Therefore, it formed a unity of religious and civic community. Until the 10th century, Friday prayers were held in only one mosque in each city. These were called Jami or Friday mosques. What was the architectural structure of a mosque? At first, probably for practical reasons, suitable buildings very often sacred ones, were converted into mosques. But on the other hand, large representative buildings were also erected. These were also often built in direct connection with the seat of the ruler. In Syria, this combination of secular power and religion can be seen in the great Umayyad Mosque in Damascus under Caliph Al-Walid I but more about that later. The earliest type of mosque architecture is the so-called hypostyle mosque, like the Great Mosque in Kairouan. These were rectangular and the interior was constructed as a pillared hall. In front of the prayer hall is a wide courtyard. In Iran, a unique form of mosque architecture developed. From 1040, the Turkic Seljuks took over and added domes in front of the Mihrab area. This was presumably done to exalt the ruler who performed his prayers there. In Isfahan, the four Ivan scheme was developed. Here, four Ivans were inserted into the whole construction thereby aligning the structure with the center of the courtyard. This is probably related to the development of palace architecture, which we will discuss next week. Maybe to clarify, what is an Ivan? It is a high hall that is open to one side and covered with a barrel vault. Here, four are facing towards the courtyard. As you can see here, Mosques often also had a madrasa building, a juridical theological college, which developed into an independent institution from the 11th century onwards. The Dome Mosque with an Ivan architecture was also adopted in India. In the Mughal period, it developed into a typical form of Indian mosques with three large domes arranged side by side above the prayer hall. In contrast, the centralized domed mosque type was widespread in Turkey. The breakthrough was achieved by the architect Sinan in the Princess Mosque in Istanbul in the 16th century. 
In later buildings, he adopted the vaulting scheme of the Hagia Sophia, which is actually a great example of how a church was converted into a mosque. The first minaret of the Hagia Sophia was probably raised in 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire. Also here in this section drawing, you can see a prominent feature, the minaret. Let us now have a look at the mosque's particular elements and their functions. I mentioned the minbar, which is an elevated seat next to the mihrab that the preacher used as a pulpit. Then the mihrab. A mihrab is a semicircular niche on the qibla wall, indicating the direction of Mecca. It is inserted into the wall surface and a sovereignty motif from late antiquity, so it is similar to the apse in early Christian church interiors. It often contains the motif of a lamp, alluding to the light verse in the Quran. This light symbolism makes the mihrab a sacred place. The inscriptions are mostly Quranic quotations, and a throne, the throne verse is also found here, describing God's omnipotence and omnipresence. Lastly, the minaret. A minaret is usually a tower outside from which the muezzin proclaims the call to worship five times a day. The Mosque of Kairouan from the 8th or 9th century has one of the oldest surviving minarets, a tower that is 35 meters high. At least its base still dates to the early 9th century. This architecture may go back to the model of ancient lighthouses, actually. In the landscape, it set a very clear accent as a sign of Islamic presence. In the middle, you can see the Qutub Minar from 1199, a minaret and so-called victory tower that is over 72 meters tall. The one on the right is from the Hagia Sophia and was added in the early 16th century. Okay, let's now zoom in into the earliest mosque, the Great Mosque of Damascus, built from 705 to 715 for Al-Walid I. As a royal foundation, it occupies a public site in the city and was built over an earlier pagan temple and a church. Do you remember last week's lecture about the Dome of the Rock, which was also built over sacred precedence? Here, elements of late antique Byzantine architecture were integrated into the concept of the pillared hall with hierarchically structured um, building types and oriented towards the ruler. Its structure is reminiscent of uh, basilica architecture. It consists of a courtyard with an arcaded walkway and a three-aisled layout imitating the design of a late antique church, except for the difference in orientation. The central axis, you can see here, is accentuated by a high transept. As we know, the Umayyads like to use traditional styles, such as the spolia of the Corinthian columns and stone slabs. In this case, it is known that the caliph received 200 skilled workers from the Byzantine emperor to decorate the buildings. If we look at the decoration, it is important to keep in mind that only a small part of the wall mosaics are actually preserved. We see that vegetal ornaments are again omnipresent. You can find Byzantine parallels, but also those with the Dome of the Rock. There are elongated trees to the right belonging to a tradition of paradisiac iconography. In between, almost as if you had to look through a forest into the distance, you can spot composite structures of different buildings. From the manner in which they are constructed, 
they are very similar to interior frescoes in Italy, like the ones in a 1st century BCE villa in Bosco Reale. They are stylized and fantastical cityscapes without any figural depictions. There are different interpretations about what is actually shown here. Are they representations of desert castles, which we will talk about next week? There are no city walls, and as such, it must be a peaceful, paradisical world. Is it perhaps a heavenly city or paradise itself? Or do the architectural vignettes represent the topography of Damascus? Are these perhaps also the regions under Umayyad control? We can conclude that this architecture reflects the borrowings from classical and Christian architecture and decoration, as is typical for the Umayyads as the first Islamic dynasty. However, we also have intricate interlacing of floral motifs and palmettes, which can be referred to as arabesque, which will become prevalent in later Islamic art. In the following, I would like to continue with an overview of mosque decoration in more or less chronological order. Here in the center, for example, the mosque of Ibn Tulun in Cairo, Egypt, built in the late 9th century. You can see the floral and geometric decorations of carved stucco and wood in the arches, which might seem more familiar to you when you think about Islamic ornaments. Actually, these go back to the Samara style of the 9th century in Iraq, here to the bottom left. From there, this new aesthetic in wall decorations is derived and mainly seen in palaces and houses. Probably it would have also been painted in different colors. Or to the right, you see the Haji Piyada Mosque in Balkh, the oldest mosque in Afghanistan, with geometrical and stylized floral decoration. Also in the early 12th century Akmar Mosque in Cairo, similar techniques were used. To the left, you see the facade with stucco carvings, niches, mukarnas. These are the elements that look a bit like honeycombs to the sides. And very importantly, monumental script. We know that already in early Islamic buildings, there, there were inscriptions. And now we have a very prominent one in angular script, in hierarchical order and size. The inscription implores God to give the caliph victory over all infidels, and it exalts the family of Ali. To the right, we see the minaret of Jam in Afghanistan, also built in the 12th century. On it are almost a hundred verses with a likely missionary function. But there is a novelty here. The baked brick is interspersed with color as the brick is glazed in turquoise blue at some instances. The letters exalt the patron who had the mosque built. So a new technique was tried out and it highlights specific areas with the use of color. First, only this turquoise color was used. Then the palette was expanded. This found its refined expression under the Timurids in Iran in the late 14th and 15th centuries. They inherited all of these traditions and combined them. For example, in the mosque built for Bibi Khanum, Timur's wife in Samarkand, dated to 1399 um, to 1404. You can see a large portal architecture completely structured with decoration. This includes the large inscription panel at the top, mostly geometric motifs denoting specific areas of the facade, like for example, the blind niches or the friezes. Within the star-shaped motifs to the sides, you can read the name of God, Allah. Often you can also see the names of the Prophet Muhammad or Ali. 
You can also see the typical dome structure with large inscription friezes and cartouches using different techniques. These include the so-called banai from the word builder, glazed and carved tile, and, tile, and mosaic tiles. The mosaic tile technique means that these are very colorful motifs made of different pieces that are stuck together like a puzzle. These pieces of different color were fired at different temperatures. The carved tiles technique means that you carve away the design to create several networks of design or layers on top of each other. Finally, the banai technique is made of combinations of glazed and unglazed bricks that are arranged in specific patterns. This Timurid manuscript painting gives a great indication how these structures looked like. More about Persian manuscripts in week four. Now let's turn to the Safavid period in Iran and to the city of Isfahan and Shah Abbas I. On the main square, the Naqsh Jahan, there are two mosques. One is the Friday Mosque or Shah Mosque, straight ahead, and the other one to the left, the so-called Sheikh Lotfola Mosque, a private one. The Shah Mosque was built in the early 17th century and epitomizes the era and its ruler. It is built in the four Ivan plan. Here you can see the decorations of one of them with mukarnas at the top, surrounded by and interspersed with inscription panels and other geometrical and floral motifs. The faience tile method used is called haftarangi or seven colors because it combines seven colors. The main color scheme was blue with turquoise, yellow and white. The vaulted structures inside with their tile work are very impressive. Their mini domes form star-shaped and rosette patterns. In the middle, you can see the different techniques in detail. Lastly, let's have a look at the other mosque at the Maidan, the Sheikh Lotfola Mosque, which is built in the domed square chamber plan. It is much smaller, but its decoration is very impressive. It was completed in 1619. Unlike the Shah Mosque, this one was meant to be private and only for the royal court. As such, it is smaller and has no minarets. The name comes from an inscription within the mosque, and Sheikh Lotfola was likely a famous imam at the royal, at the royal court. It has a large entrance gateway covered with tiles, which are unfortunately 20th century restorations here to the left. You enter through an L-shaped tunnel here on the second image from the left into the main domed room, the prayer chamber. Again, there are Quranic inscriptions and the walls are covered with tiles in blue, turquoise, yellow and white with intricate geometric and floral patterns. The dome shows a typical shamse, a sun symbol associated with the light of God and the heavens. Light also falls in through the perforated window decorations. You can see the typical arabesque motifs that span over the surface seemingly endlessly. By now, we can distinguish the typical de de decorative patterns used in Islamic art. The floral motifs called arabesque, geometrical patterns and calligraphy, all of which can be combined and frequently overlap. Together, they create elaborate decorative surfaces, like here at the Jama Masjid in Fatehpur Sikri from the 17th century. However, different techniques developed in various regions, like the so-called Zelish technique in Morocco, 
like here at the Bu Inania Madrasa in Fez from the 14th century. Juxtaposed, you have stucco decoration, calligraphy, tiles, and at the bottom, this specific technique. It is a particular style of tile mosaic from individual pieces sent, set into a plaster base. And it is actually typical for Moroccan architecture. Another example are the Iznik tiles, created in a town in Anatolia from the late 15th to the late 17th century. They produced a lot of ceramics, combining Ottoman arabesques with Chinese elements. They were produced in large quantities and decorates many buildings designed by Sinan. For example, the Rustem Pasha Mosque, built in 1563, was lavishly decorated with tiles of more than 80 different designs. After this very short and abbreviated run through of mosque structure and different decorative styles, let us conclude with a quote referring to the term ornament. Ornament usually means that it is applied in order to embellish a surface without directly having a particular function or meaning. It is widely believed that Islamic art has its greatest strength in the decorative design of surfaces. This is because of its rhythmic order of lines and structural elements. But to what extent can ornament and the carrier medium be separated? Is the decoration merely an addition to the visual perception of the surface, only giving it a high aesthetic value? Let us quickly recount what we looked at before. We saw vegetal designs in mosaics in early Islamic buildings, then carved stucco ornamentation, then perhaps from the 10th century onwards, the typical arabesque design, a floral pattern based on geometry. We saw star patterns and the muqarnas. These different types of ornaments can be used in various materials and techniques on architecture, like in brick, stucco, tiles and mosaic tiles. But they are not limited to architecture. They can also be found on ceramics, textiles or in manuscripts, as we will see later. The geometric and floral heritage of late antiquity was two-dimensional and organic abstract. In Islamic art, this flat ornamentation was developed even further. Chinese inspirations joined in from the 13th century and especially from the 15th century in Iran. These Chinese links in ornamentation even extended to the Ottoman Empire and the Iznik tiles. By copying model designs, these motifs were often able to travel long distances thanks to traveling craftsmen. Often the individual parts of the decorations are combined in such a way that they cannot be perceived separately. Also, do the patterns express a particular meaning? This is definitely the case with writing. Inscriptions have a formal aesthetic, are often combined with tendril elements and are subject to a certain proportioning. They carry intrinsic meaning and contain references, but sometimes the inscription are so complexly in superimposed by other ornaments that they are very difficult to decipher. Next week, we will talk about imperial iconography and palaces, where we will see a lot of similar aspects we discussed in this lecture. Again, thank you very much for listening. Check out the online classroom for assignments and notifications. And above all, stay tuned for next week's lecture. Bye bye.